This is Coons Ford Terp Talk with Bruce Posner. 60 minutes of Maryland athletics and your phone calls at 410-481-1300. Now, here's Bruce Posner and Terp Talk. And we welcome everybody in this week after a pretty much disastrous weekend for the locals. But you know what the good thing about it is? We got two more games this week for the Ravens and the uh, University of Maryland Terrapins. And to start the show off, bring in my good buddy Wayne Viner, frequent co-host here. Wayne, how are you doing? Doing okay, and uh, welcome to sunny Hartford, Connecticut today. Oh, right. You're on the road, huh? Yes, I am. You scouting the Huskies? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm actually not. I have some uh, business to take care of that's not sports related That's today. impossible. I tie up all your time now. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint, but that, that's where we are with it at the moment. All right, I got to ask you a quiz question. You ready? Sure. All right, what's the good thing about a Yankee-Red Sox series? Good thing is one of them's going to lose. You got it, brother. Boy, it was fun watching the Yankees losing at home last night. Just had to throw you know, it in. It, to me, it's always nice to see the Yankees lose. Or the Red Sox, all right? So now I get to root for uh, Houston to beat the Red Sox to end the baseball season for me. And hopefully uh, Milwaukee can put a little upset on the uh, Dodgers, but I doubt it. Where are you, at a UFC match? Yeah, that's what it feels like. I'll be back where it's quiet here in a second. All right. Wayne, I, I open up the paper today and I took a look at Rutgers, Maryland, and I saw something that just made me lose my mind. How in the world can Maryland be 26 point favorite over anybody? That's a great question. Even, I mean, Rutgers, I mean, Rutgers, Rutgers played Indiana, only won by set, only lost by seven, uh, lost by 40 to Kansas, 21 to Illinois. Boy, they haven't even gotten to the heart of the schedule yet. <laughs> well, let's look look back in history. Well, one thing about Rutgers is they're known for having the first college football game of all time was Rutgers. Next year will be 150 years of college wow. football. So it's going to be wow. a big celebration. Over the years, Rutgers is one game under 500 all time. I think there's 640, 641, about 40 ties. So historically, they're not that bad. But man, Chris Ash is seven and twenty-three since coming to Rutgers. How's he not keep his job, numbers. Wayne? How's he keep his job? I don't know. Over that time, Maryland, despite their problems, have been thirteen and seventeen. Rutgers seven and twenty-three. Look, if they don't, they have a lot of freshmen, sophomores. They're sort of in a bit of a rebuild, but they're horrible. I, they're probably the worst Power Five college football team. Their passing defense is 205 yards a game, but their rushing offense is 229. I mean, we could get a couple guys with 100 yards plus this week. I think that's your game plan. But the question that you and I keep having sort of offline is what's going on with Kasim Hill and why is this passing game just not work? And it's just not working at the moment. It, it, I have to tell you, it was pretty distressing last week. I think... I think I was watching, we were texting back and forth during the game, and even you, would, no, Mason, it was Mason, even Mason said when it was like 17-7 to 7, that there was no way we could win the game. In other words, there was just no way. And until the game got totally out of hand, did we move the ball. And uh, that's more than just passing. That's just a great defense by, uh, by Michigan. But, you know, we're up 7-3. to three. Great TD run by uh, uh, Johnson. Ty Johnson. Right, Ty who Johnson. Who is the Big Ten uh, Special Teams Player of the Week. That's helping us out a lot. And uh, to get a ball back on an interception, a tremendous play by 25 as usual. And they get the ball like it was a 45-yard line midfield, and they do nothing. That was the time they had a strike. If they get up 14-3, to three, and as I talked with Macy, he said, Bruce, if if Michigan has to pass, if they're down 14-3 to three and they have to pass, they're just not a great passing team. And it could have been a little bit different, but that's not what happened. And before you knew it, the game was over. But uh, tell so us. That, that is not so hot, but for a while there, we had a lead. 
And so, for a while there, despite the fact we probably weren't going to really get back in it, it wasn't out of hand. To me, this is progress. Uh, we didn't lose 50 to 10. We didn't lose 60 to 3. We were in the game for a while. It's better than it was. It's just that we probably had a shot at this one if we could have thrown the ball a little bit. Matt, Matt Canada was a little like up in the air when they asked him, well, who's going to quarterback? And he did say both guys are going to play. I think it, is the movement toward Pogrom a little bit? Bruce, unfortunately, I'm in a spot where I just can't hear you. I'll call the studio back in a few minutes if that's okay. All right, that's fine. What I was saying is that Matt, Matt Canada was asked about who's going to be the starting quarterback. <coughs> it's still going to be Kasim Hill. But you kind of heard for the first time a little talk about uh, Terrell Pogrom. He's going to definitely get some reps, and he's going to play probably a little bit more. And this passing thing must be dealt with because the passing offense for Maryland is, uh, well, it's 200 yards a game. But let me see, the 141, yeah, 141 a game, 258 yards rushing, but it just isn't that good. And it's not working for Maryland. Uh, there's Wayne. Let's see if we get him back on. So I, I'm not sure what's going to happen with the offense. The defense, I don't think, played that bad. I mean, eventually, when you're on the field the whole time, you, you kind of, like, wear down. Wayne, my question was, it seemed like Canada was hedging between Pagrom and, uh, and Kasim Hill a little bit. I would. At, the, at this point, you have to... If the see how to put this, Piggy can throw the ball okay, but he can run. Right now, Kasim Hill seems like he really can't get out of the way of the rush, and when it's not happening on time for him, he's having a lot of problems. Although Matt Canada publicly says he's 100 percent behind Kasim, we have to win a football game here. I'm starting to wonder if Piggy might not be the better choice. What do you think? Yeah, I, well, here's the thing. If if Kasim Hill stalls again, I mean, you're talking about in the first half, we had seven points. What does that mean? It means we didn't score. You know, and, and the problem with that is if you're not moving the ball at least and getting some yards, then who's going to get worn out? The defense. And what happened, Wayne? Eventually. Over time. Hey, the defense was pretty good for 20 minutes. But they did wear out. It didn't take all game. By the third quarter, the defense was sort of done because the offense didn't help at all. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it wasn't there. And uh, I thought we might see a little bit more McFarland this week because he didn't seem to have a, a, get a lot of reps last week. But passes have to be complete. I, I think that they might have to open up throwing the ball a little bit. But look, this is another game. They're three and two. You win this game, you're four and two, and you're two two games closer to the uh, ultimate goal of getting to a bowl. And in this particular season, I think that would be a tremendous achievement at this point. But uh, you know, I mean, Wade Lee's has been good, the punter. Trey Watson's been unbelievable, unbelievable. That's a kid who left Illinois, isn't it, Wayne? It is, and he is a, he's a good story. He's a great interview, and he's one of the top tacklers Maryland's had. You know, Jermaine Carter's with the Carolina Panthers, and Trey Watson has stepped right in and taken his spot and done a great job of it. Why did he leave Illinois? Fifth-year transfer. He still wanted to go someplace where he felt he had a chance to win. And of all the things, you know, you needed somebody in the league who wanted – a quarter a uh, linebacker, and he could come in and start. Maryland fit that bill, and when he signed up, it looked like we were on the upswing, and we still might get to a ball. Illinois does not look like they're getting to a ball. It was probably a good move for him. Right. Uh, and I think that maybe, I wouldn't swear to it, but I think Maryland's been a little bit more productive getting guys in the NFL in the past decade than Illinois. Uh, I don't have that in front of me. It's just a feeling I have. So this particular week... We lost uh, Richard Lewis, Ray Lewis's son, and uh, Byron Cowart to to uh, concussion to uh, what do you call it? What's the word? What's the word? Uh, Wayne? What's the word for leading with your helmet? I can't think what the targeting. Word. targeting. Targeting is the word you're looking for. And yet, and yet, in the first series of play, our quarterback. 
Kasim Hill was targeted, and we're lucky we got the call of 15 yards. Why wasn't that targeted ever, Chick? I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know. I was listening to the radio feed. They didn't know why. Later in the half, he got horse collar tackled. They didn't call that. They hit by Cowart. They didn't throw him out. In fact, they went back and said it wasn't targeting. It was just a late hit. Michigan scored a touchdown on that play, so it didn't matter that much. Um, so the only guy that we have not played in the first half is uh, Lewis? I believe so. Okay. Well, I don't know. And when you look at what he did, he kind of like crossed up. You know, it's the, the both in the uh, NFL and college, it's really getting out of hand with the penalties. It's just so many of them that I, I don't know where it's going to lead to. But uh, tell me about the game this week. I can't, There's no way we can lose this game. I mean, there's just no way. We've said this before. Let's just take the clock back a couple of weeks against Temple. It said there's no way we could lose this game. Unfortunately, the last four times Maryland's played Rutgers, it's been a split. Uh, I believe Rutgers has a losing record against the rest of the Big Ten. They're 500 against Maryland. So, who knows? I do not expect to lose the game. Uh, Rutgers is going to start a true freshman at quarterback, which is Satowski. He had a good statistical game last week. Rutgers lost. They start a fellow who played a lot for BC at tailback, or I know Hillman. He had a, he's had a few touchdowns this year. They're just not very good on offense, and they're not very good on defense. And uh, I guess if you're not good on either one, you're going to lose most of the game. They won the first game. They haven't been close since. Uh, maybe Maryland can actually cover this week, but there's something about Maryland playing Rutgers and Maryland being a favorite. It's, it's just almost too good to be true. 25 and a half points, where that comes from, I don't know. Let's look, let's look around the uh, college football. Uh, Northwestern hosts Nebraska and Scott Frost. Scott Frost is having a good season, isn't he? <laughs> Boy, he is. They might win one game. They might beat Bethune Cookman. It's been a horrible year at Nebraska. They might win this week against Northwestern. Iowa goes into Indiana. Iowa, naturally, because Maryland has to go to Iowa in two weeks, you'll be covering that game for Turp Talk. And uh, five and a half point favorites at Indiana. Indiana's look pretty good in my eyes. They haven't they haven't been great. They haven't been bad. They're sort of in the middle. They're, I would say, quality-wise, they're sort of close to where Maryland is, somewhere in the middle of this pack. But when you have the other four big boy teams on our side of the ledger, it's hard to move up, Bruce. I think that Maryland-Indiana game is going to be pivotal, but I'm going to take Iowa in this one. Yeah, Wisconsin goes to Michigan. Wisconsin's getting eight points. It seems impossible for Wisconsin ever to get eight points. And uh, the way they can run the ball, control the clock, uh, I think this could be a tough one for Michigan. I would never lay the eight against uh, Wisconsin. I'm going to take Wisconsin in the points. Wisconsin lost to BYU. It was a huge national upset. Since then, BYU hasn't won another game. Wisconsin's back on their winning ways. Look, as a one-loss team, Wisconsin, probably if they win out, it's going to look really good to the bowl committee. Really good. Temple's going to Navy. Temple's a seven-point favorite, and Temple's been okay. I mean, they had a, they had a little bit of a run after they beat Maryland, but uh, playing Navy at Navy is always a tough task because you know you'd never get less than 100% from Navy. Navy just hasn't been the same this year. No, they haven't. Uh, Temple, to me, you know, it's one of Mason's always sleeper favorites. He has uh, some affiliation. He really likes Temple. Uh, I'm going to have to I'm going to take Temple this time. Maybe it's just in a down period. UCF. I mean, UCF Memphis should be maybe the game of the week. That's a heck of a game. <laughs> might get up to 100 in that game, huh? You, you might. Uh, UCF has been on, on just they've been on such a roll. If UCF had a bigger brand name, uh, their quarterback would be on the Heisman list. He's on the list, which is Milton but he's not very high on the list. If they were a power five, a big-time school, that kid would be a, a near Heisman favorite. Correct uh, me. What, correct me. I, I, go ahead. I want to go back a week. 
Did you see the end of the Texas Oklahoma game? Great, great, great game. Great game. Yeah. Uh, do you think Texas is for real? It was a 48-45 game. It's hard to think somebody's for real. I've picked them every week since they beat, since they lost to Maryland. I when I watched that game against Maryland, they were facing, they were facing a team that was on a different kind of mission. You were there, you saw it, you saw when those kids came in after the field. I'm not sure anybody short of the Ohio States and Alabamas of the world could have beat Maryland that day. And I think that they just succumbed to, to the spirit that how Maryland was playing that game for Jordan McNair. And I know that might sound corny to a lot of people listening, but I was there. And you too, Wayne, when you came up to me after being down mm-hmm. in the field, you said right. something's different about this team today. Ray Lewis was there. Everybody was there on that sideline. Yeah. And uh, so I, and when I saw that number 84, the real tall wide receiver, and I saw right. how they were moving the ball, Maryland just was, you know, at the right place at the right time. They outcoached Tom Herman. Tom mm-hmm. Herman was not ready for the jet sweep, and Maryland shoved it down his throat. I wouldn't want to play him again. I'll put it to you like that. No, and I, I don't know where that Maryland offense took off to. Um, I know we're running short on the clock here. My overall take for Maryland, I know we'll do this again on Saturday, is we have to get a game where Maryland gets more than 52 or 53 snaps. Maryland, as they just haven't had the ball, they can't get a first down. Uh, the good news is Maryland leads the country in red zone efficiency. Every time Maryland gets it inside the 20, they get a touchdown. They are the number one ranked. Welcome back to Coons Ford Terp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. Back here on segment two of Coons Ford presents Terp Talk. On the phone right now, I hadn't been on for a couple weeks. Got to catch up on all the non-rev stuff, and that's my buddy Todd Carton. Todd, welcome in, my friend. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, it's been a while. Yeah, well, it's time to get caught up. I mean, it's been so much else going on, but uh, we kind of fell behind. And uh, get us up to date with the soccer team, the men's soccer team, right away. I know there was a very tough loss against Michigan last week. Uh, Michigan State, yeah. Michigan State. It, it, this team is not performing the way we think they should. And I'm sure the coach is very upset about it. Yeah, uh, Sasha, Sasha's a uh, little frustrated. You know, it, it looked, Bruce, like they were sort of finding their stride. They, they won a big game at Northwestern where they have had some trouble in past years when they've gone out there. Uh, they had a, a, a an incomprehensible sort of mind lapse against Wisconsin that let Wisconsin uh, tie the game with the uh, 50 seconds left and then lost in overtime. But then they, but they were scoring and, and, and they scored a great shutout Rutgers two to nothing. They scored three goals against uh, coastal Carolina down there, which is a pretty decent team. And now they're back in one of these scoring funks. They haven't scored. Uh, they did, they got shut out by Michigan state and then played Georgetown to a nothing, nothing tie. And, from what I read about the game, uh, the only team that got any kind of a real challenging shot on goal was Georgetown got one. Maryland had seven, six or seven shots on goal, but apparently none were really of any challenge to the goalie. And, and now they go out and they play Indiana Friday night, who's, you know, top five, top two, whatever in the country. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot, lot uh, riding on this game for them. That game's at Indiana, correct? That's correct. Well, you know what, though? They need a game like that because if they don't win a couple games like that, they're not going to go anywhere. You know? Well, right. And, and, no, they're, not I mean, get a, they're not going to get a bid if they're 500 in the Big Ten with no big wins. No, they, and they, they, have to, uh, you know, they, they have to get into the top three or four in the Big Ten. You know, they've got to win some games. They're, they're struggling in conference. They're 2-2 two and two right now. Uh, so... So they're kind of floating in the middle of the pack, and you know there's a lot of a lot of games left. That, uh, in, but Indiana is probably the biggest one on the schedule. Michigan will be a big game. That's out there. Um, they have three straight home games after Indiana. They bring Denver in, which could also be their pretty quality team. Then Ohio State and Penn State. 
uh, come into Ludwig, and then they finish up at Michigan. So speaking of Penn State, what the, what the heck happened Sunday? The the uh, field, undefeated field hockey team went down to them, didn't they? Yes, they did. And uh, Bruce, you know, it's funny because uh, I, I watched them play Connecticut a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, and they looked like the best college team in the country by miles. If Connecticut was number two in the country at that time, they just absolutely dominated UConn. Then they, they came home. And, and they struggled a little bit uh, against Rutgers, but they, they got the win but weren't really sharp. And frankly, um, the game at Penn State was the exact opposite. Penn State just absolutely dominated that game from beginning to end. Maryland just was, was never in it. Uh, there, nothing worked for Maryland. Offense, defense, goaltending, nothing. It was, it was just uh, the three to one score, frankly, was not as indicative uh, of the, how one side of the game was in terms of the flow of play. Was Penn State ranked? Yeah, they were ranked, I think, fifth. I mean, they're, they're top five, top seven team, uh, but it, but, and it was on the road. And so it it's was, not a major upset, but you didn't like the flow of the game. We were dominated, and Maryland's never dominated. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Penn, Penn State was kind of getting into the scoring circle at will. Um, Maryland wasn't. Uh, and, you know, Penn State, you know, again, they pressured Maryland. Maryland's passing wasn't crisp. But just nothing really seemed to be working. It was, and, and it's funny because, because the volleyball team had a similar game at Penn State uh, last uh, Friday when, when they went out and, and hoped to be competitive against the Penn State team that isn't top five in the country, they're top ten. Uh, and they, but Penn State's been playing well. And, and I was talking to, to Adam Hughes recently, and he said, yeah, I don't know what happened. We had our walkthrough before the game, and, and just something seemed off. And Penn State just absolutely dominated them. Fortunately, they came back and, and uh, swept Rutgers uh, Saturday night. And they have a huge weekend this weekend, volleyball um, hosting Michigan State and Michigan, I think it's it's kind of a, a pivotal weekend for them. Uh, they need to, I think, get to seven wins in conference to get to 500 and have the possibility of uh, making the NCAA. And uh, if they don't pick up at least one win this weekend, I think the window narrows for that possibility a lot. How about last one, uh, women's soccer? How's their season going? I know it was se- I can't believe it was Senior Day the other day. Yeah, they have they have what they do actually have one more home game. Uh, you know, Maryland's taken to doing this a lot. They have these Senior Days um, that aren't always the last home game. That here, the, the the positive is that they just beat Northwestern, who was ranked 14th in the country. The positive is that they got their second win in conference for the first time in Ray Leone's three years here. Uh, the negative is they're still 4-7-4. Four, and four. They're 2-4 and four with a tie in the conference. Uh, they, too, generally struggle scoring. But, you know, I mean, what's amazing is that Northwestern's goalie had a string of, like, five straight shutouts. I don't know if that was coming into the game or in the few games before that. And Maryland scored twice on them on two just beautiful goals last weekend. Um, they play at Penn State and at Ohio State this weekend, uh, then at Michigan next Thursday, and finish up on Sunday to the 21st against Indiana. So last question before I let you go. Maryland, the, the hockey squad is what in the country? Third? Uh, I haven't. I didn't look. The ra- rankings, the updated rankings usually come out on, on Wednesday, and I, I didn't check them because I thought it would depress me. Uh, they were number two going into the Penn State game, so they, they'll probably they're probably still top five. Who's number one? Uh, North Carolina. Okay, have they lost? They had not lost the last time I looked, and and have a phenomenal def- defense. They they've given up like three goals all year, or something like that. What's your take on the Maryland football game? How can Maryland be twenty five and a half point favorites over anybody? Yeah. You know, Bruce. Now, I can't that, imagine that, uh, Todd. It, it doesn't make sense. Well, and and what what really I think makes less sense to me is is that I, I think the spread has widened since the fir- the first spread came out. I think it was twenty three, which means people really must think Rutgers is just 
god awful because you know I don't think Maryland Maryland has never really stomped Rutgers the way that that you you would think if you're a three and a half touchdown favorite. Um, you know, I, it worries me a little bit, and and um, you know we, we they just announced that Brett Kolka's out for the season, so we're and we're down two players on the defensive side of the ball in addition to him for the first half of the game because of the ejections from last week. Yeah, you know, I I, I don't get it. I really don't. But uh, Rutgers must be really poor. But that's all right. We need an easy game. We really do. Uh, yeah. Because after well, this, you got Iowa, then you come back home for Illinois, and then you, you've got Michigan State and uh, Indiana, and you got to find a win there, don't you? You have to yeah, find a win there. And, and, you know, most people think that, that Illinois and Indiana are very winnable games, which they probably are, but... You know, Indiana's not as bad as I think people projected them to be at the beginning of the season. They they hung with Ohio State for, for a while last weekend. Yeah, I tell you what, I'm really looking forward to basketball to start already. I really, <laughs> you know, I really am. Because I, I, I'm very high on the basketball team, and uh, I'm just looking forward to it. And uh, well, well, speaking of basketball, I'm going to get in a plug, and, I, and I've been meaning to text you and call you um, – I, I have uh, two courtside seats for UMBC men's and women's basketball this season. Oh, that's great. Well, I'll be your guest several times because, you know, I love going there. And yeah. uh, to catch Ryan Odom, uh, uh, first of all, tremendous arena. I love it. I, yeah. really, I really like the arena a lot. Easy to get in, easy to park. There ain't, it's one of those stadiums, You see, one of those arenas, there's not a bad seat. You can be last row of the upper deck, and it's kind of like being 20 rows from the court at College Park. Yeah. So, uh, a dynamite stadium, and certainly I read where, look, UMBC's got an opening game against Marquette. That's kind of like a big game. You know? Yeah. It really is. It really is. You know, and... Uh, I'm glad to see you got your uh, court. I love courtside. You know that. So uh, yeah, and and the br- the brilliant thing is, Bruce, two seats courtside for both men's and women's together, seven hundred bucks. Oh, uh, that's ridiculous. That's <laughs> that's that's a steal. I mean, when you consider how UMBC did last year and the quality of teams they play, uh, Vermont, Ver- that Vermont game. You know, after that Vermont game last year, you would have told me UMBC was going to make the tournament. You know, and pull a couple upsets. I just said you're out of your mind. Right yeah, or wrong. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we 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 saw them play when they opened the arena against Vermont, and Vermont just looked like a much better team. Took them to school. They took them to school that day. You know, yes, they did. But uh, great arena, great people there, and Todd certainly one of the leaders there. Uh, he he wears two uniforms, UMBC and Maryland. Might even tend toward UMBC a little bit more, but we'll forgive him for that. <laughs> Todd, thanks a lot for checking in, and uh, we'll see you, I assume, Saturday at the game. Yeah, I'll be there, Bruce. This is Coons Ford Term Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. All right, a few minutes late today in a different segment, but always present on Turp Talk, and that's my good friend and sponsor of Turp Talk, Dennis Kalatsis from Coons Ford. Dennis, welcome in. Bruce, it's always my pleasure. How are you? It's my pleasure today. I love today looking in the uh, on ESPN that Joe Flacco's wife has given him hell for the disinterest he shows at wide receiver. I plan somebody said something. Really? I didn't see that. His, yep. his wife called him out? Well, his wife called him out, and it's absolutely ridiculous. He stands there. Well, I mean, if he's just going to... Oh, you mean, oh, you mean if... Uh, okay, I, thought, I thought he was calling him out for not hitting his receivers, which is something else. No, 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 no. He calls him out that when Lamar Jackson's a quarterback, he stands there. First oh, of all, Lamar... why is he in the game? What is the purpose? Well, you know, in, in, in Lamar's defense, when Lamar's in the game, they've been successful about 85% of the time. He does draw eyeballs, but I would take it a step further. I would sit Joe Flanco out while Lamar Jackson's in there because he's right. When, when Lamar's in there, essentially you have 10 and 11. But Joe missed a lot of throws against the Browns, and the receiver didn't get any separation. So, the, the, you know, the, the Ravens have other problems besides Lamar Jackson being in the game. They're, they're taking the focus away from what the real problem is, and that's Joe's uh, woes on the road. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's something, a stat I'm sure you know, but now it's been seven quarters and an overtime with no touchdowns. 
And well, he's Bruce, been... you know what? I, I took this loss harder than most losses because although the Browns are much improved, they're not as good as the Ravens. The Ravens are a much better football team. And between the coaching and the offense and Joe Flacco, that's where they blew the game. Well, you forgot one factor. And, you know, I called up, I called up uh, Dennis back and forth during the game, but I called him up screaming when uh, – when, uh, what's his name, uh, Crabtree dropped the pass in the end zone, which after yeah. all that happened, would have won the game. And Dennis says, what are you screaming at me for? <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I tell I, you what, Crabtree's on, th- he's on a thin line right now. All right, I don't, know what, I don't know what his signing bonus was, but I know it wasn't any $20 million. Well, I said it in the preseason, I'm going to say it again. Lamar Jackson will be the starting uh, quarterback of the Ravens in 2019. He may be the starting quarterback at some point this year. But I tell you what, Marty Mordenwick also is doing the guys a disservice. When the other teams play us man-to-man, he doesn't have routes or schemes to get these wide receivers open. And the same thing that happened against Cincinnati happened against the Browns. They played them in a tight man coverage, and the receivers couldn't get separation. They were out-schemed and out-executed by the Cleveland Browns. Greg Williams schooled Marty Mordenwick. Here's the thing that, you know, you got to take a look at. Now, if before the Pittsburgh game, you had Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and uh, Tennessee on the road. If I would have said to you, would you be happy if the Ravens won two out of three of those games? You would have jumped for joy and said yes, right or wrong. I would have, Bruce, but that's unfair because this this team should have been four and one after Sunday contest. It shouldn't be three and two. They but shouldn't be staring down three and three at this point. You just don't always play great on the road. I mean, it just doesn't happen. I you take a look at any of the teams in the NFL, and they're all having their road woes. And you know, we were fortunate to put up a great game against Pittsburgh, but we stunk last week. There's no other way to put Bruce, it. Bruce, if somebody told you Saturday, this past Saturday, that the Browns are going to score 12 points and gave you $10,000, you, you'd put it on the Ravens. There's no way a team averaging 30 point, 30.8 points per game doesn't score more than 12 points in Cleveland on Sunday. It just doesn't happen. No, it, do- no, it doesn't, but it did. That's the unfortunate thing. What, 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 is, what does Sunday look like for Tennessee? It's another game where the Ravens are favored. Well, they, you know, but with Cleveland, though, although the line started three points, Bruce, it, it moved closer to pick them before kickoff. I expect the same thing to happen against the the Titans. I don't see any reason why the Ravens should be a three point favorite. Dennis, you know, you, here's the other here's the other thing. Dean Pease, you don't think Dean Pease is hard up for this one? You don't think Dean Pease knows Joe Flacco, his strength and weaknesses inside out? That's the to me that's the the underlying story against the Titans this Sunday. Well, contrarily, so, contrarily. I would think the team's got to be fired up after Dean Pease's lies and malarkey about retiring, and he winds up with Tennessee in, what, 10 days? So I think there's got to be some uh, tit-for-tat there where the okay. Ravens are got to be, I mean, Harbaugh's got to be upset about that. Bruce, all I know is that if these are the same old Ravens and they missed the playoffs again this year, we're going to have a whole new coaching staff next season. You can bet that. No, there's no doubt about it. This team can't miss the playoffs. I mean, there's no way. And you know, now you got to you, know, you got New Orleans coming in. Then you got to go to Carolina. So, you know, the road is not easy for sure. Pittsburgh after that, and then Pittsburgh after that, and uh, and uh, not too far after Cincinnati. So well, uh, Pittsburgh doesn't have a defense. Pittsburgh has to come here. But but right now, this team looks very much like an eight and eight, nine and seven team, Bruce. I mean, they fell right back to the pack with that egg laid against the Browns. Yeah, I, I listen, Dennis. I'm not arguing with you, and it's it's heartbreaking to lose that game to Cleveland. It really is. But on the other oh, hand, I'm, if you're four and two after the first six games, and four of them have been on the road, that's not the end of the world, in my opinion. Well, you know how bipolar I've been with with Joe Flacco for the last five years, you know, and I still blame him. A guy making twenty five million dollars a year, I do expect a much better performance. And for his wife to call out Lamar Jackson, really. Lamar Jackson didn't throw that pick on the two-yard line. She didn't call out Lamar Jackson. She called out Joe Flacco. She said that her husband is not, like, what, active or as a receiver. Instead of, like, supposed to do? he's supposed to go at least run to the end zone <laughs> or maybe cut across the field okay. and pretend <laughs> like he's playing the game. Show off the wheels. That's, that's not his fault. That's, that's Marty Morty. That's coaching. That's the coaching staff not making them an active participant. 
in the offense, you know. And to me, look, rather than have at this point of the season, if they're going to put Lamar in there, take Joe out and, and give up, make it 11 on 11 versus 10 on 11. All right? Enough of the trickery, whatever they're trying to accomplish with Jackson. Uh, I, I'd like to see. You know, Jackson doesn't want to play wide receiver any more than Joe Flacco. Does. Joe, Joe Flacco doesn't want Lamar Jackson in the game. Back when they had, they had the Tyrant Taylor experiment, Joe Flacco said, look, those are 8 to 10 snaps that I want in my hand. Joe, as a competitor, wants the ball in his hand, and I appreciate that. But to me, if they're going to put Lamar in there, but again, you know, second and goal at the two-yard line, you've got Buck Allen in the backfield, and they don't hand the ball to him. They, they call a pass play. How is that possible, Bruce? I don't know, but I tell you what, I mean, first and goal from the five or six, I don't have a problem if Lamar takes over. I really don't. I agree. I couldn't agree with you more. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, to I me, couldn't agree with you more. There's too many times. Look, they're 12 for 12 to start the season, and since then, they haven't scored a touchdown. So, I mean, well, again, but, what but was, again, was. They have, they have vanilla schemes. I'm telling you, when you watch the wide receivers, they're easy to cover. They don't have any runs, any picks, any floods. I mean, they don't have a modern offense. I mean, they they got better players, better personnel. But to me, it comes down to coaching, execution. The quarterback, you know, how come Joe Flacco got all those passes batted down and six-foot-tall, barely six-foot-tall Baker Mayfield didn't get any batted down? Well, how does that happen? Listen, listen. Baker Mayfield outplayed Joe. I mean, there's no doubt about it. He he engineered. Look, Joe Flacco had the ball twice. All he had to do was engineer two drives or one drive. Yeah. One drive. Now, maybe the Ravens got a bad call on the block in the back from Chris Moore. Maybe they did. And that would have ended the game if look, it didn't happen. The but, refs were horrible on both sides. I'm I agree. You, the, well, we had two they, penalties they called against us. They had 11. They were terrible, yeah. terrible, terrible. Refereeing is atrocious in the NFL this year. But you know what? You, you got to take it out of their hands. You, you have the the NFL, the greatest kicker, the most accurate kicker in NFL history, and you don't use them enough. I mean, it's just you got to take points on the road. A lot of blame to go around, Bruce. Uh, this, this I haven't taken the loss this hard for for a long, long time. Yeah, no, you know, I agree with you. Not since Cincinnati, anyway. <laughs> yeah, not, well, that would you know when, when Flacco starts the game by throwing a pick, it's a double coverage. Yeah, it's not a good start and. That and my square jar was full for both those games before half. Well, before half time. All right, real quick, Dennis. We got to take a minute or two and talk about the Conor McGregor, uh, Khabib. I'm not even going to try his last name. Fight, and uh, where does the blame fall for this fight? Everybody's blaming Khabib and his guys, but Conor McGregor and his, and his guys really, really, to me, disgraced himself with the attack on the bus, and in some ways, it, it was retribution. Uh, to me, you know what, even, even negative publicity is great publicity. I think Mae West said it best. And, you know, what? this is great for UFC. It drew, uh, you know, people who weren't fight fans in the game. They're still buzzing about it. We're still talking about it. And uh, and what about Derek Lewis? I mean, that was even a better story, that interview. It was a fun, fun night, uh, drama-filled, action-packed. And like I said, people who aren't, who aren't normally uh, fight fans are still talking about what happened. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. In fact, you know, it was all pay-per-view, and you were nice enough to get it, and I came over. But, you know, I'd like to see it again. I'd like to see the Lewis fight and the McGregor fight again. But this thing about promoting a rematch with McGregor and Khabib, he doesn't no. have a prayer. You no, know, he was, no. It was, he, was beaten, oh. he was beaten to the, like a, to a pulp. You know, it, I would I, I wouldn't take I wouldn't make that match if I was McGregor because now that Khabib knows he can beat him, I I would venture to say that Khabib would torture him would actually just go to his body, take it to, to five rounds and beat him to the last minute. You know because I mean he spit on the guy. I mean he he has zero respect for him. It's a bad matchup for McGregor. Clearly his style doesn't fit Khabib's uh, style. So to me. He's got five more fights left, and he should steer clear of, 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 of Khabib. I wouldn't want to see a rematch, to be frank with you, because I know what the outcome is going to be. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And, uh, you know, Maryland, a three-and-a-half touchdown favorite against Rutgers. Does that even make sense? Uh, yeah. Not at all, but you know what? Hopefully, uh, hopefully, hopefully it's true. Out. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully it happens. Uh, hopefully Rutgers reads the clippings and believes them. Yeah, I don't think so. I tell you what, I see that, and I say, how can this be? But, uh, you know... Mitch Trubisky, six TDs the other day? Is Are the Bears for real? Oh, you know what? I think they are for real. They have a great, a good offensive-minded coach, young coach. Uh, now you've got Khalil Mack on defense and Roquan Smith. I mean, them boys can play some ball, and, and Mitch has come a long way. They can run the ball, certainly. 
two dynamic running backs. The Bears, the Bears are going to be in the. Uh, I, I think the Bears have a great shot of being in the playoffs. All right, real quick, first pick, first pick in the NFL draft. Is it the Alabama quarterback right now? Uh, you know what? I think it's. A, can he come out? I mean, can he even come out? It's the second year. Um, I, I don't know his age. Right? I really don't know his age. But. Yeah, he, he's young. I think he's 20 years old. I, I think when he does come out, it'll be a first-round draft pick. But, uh, uh, you know, the kids from West Virginia, Greer, he, you know, Will Greer, he's looking pretty good. And still very early to, to talk about this. I haven't even looked at the draft yet for next year. Remember the name Trey Watson from Maryland, all right? He got okay. 10 tackles last week. And uh, you see how Carter's doing in the NFL. Remember the name Trey Watson. That's my Maryland. I like that. I like I like that savage kid on the defensive backfield. He's oh, a, that's player. another one. Yeah, there, there's guys coming out from Maryland who are going to go to the next level. Dennis, we're oh, out gosh. of time. Thanks for coming on today. You'll be on tomorrow on the Sunday Sports Voice. I'll be on with you at 4.30 up the dial. And as always, great things are happening at Coons Ford. Yes, sir. Appreciate it, Bruce. Go Ravens, go Terps. All right. This is Bruce Posner. It's signing off. We made it to just under the gun a few seconds. We'll be back on the air Saturday on Coons Ford presents the Sports Maven. And then Sunday, of course, Science of Kirk presents In the Nest here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Drive safely, everyone.